All right, welcome back everybody. Thank you for settling down. Um, I'm very excited to um, initiate the next portion of the morning. Um, and we are going to, we have some really wonderful panelists this morning. You can see our website for more detailed bios of our speakers. First, we're gonna hear from a team, um, oh, Different. We're doing a different order. Okay. First, we're gonna. For, it's a good thing I know these people. First, we're gonna hear from a team that's doing some really interesting work, um, looking at implementation in the VA system. Uh, this is Ed Portillo and Martha Mora, and they're gonna speak to us about examining appropriateness, acceptability, adoption, and fidelity outcomes of an implementation package to improve the rapid uptake of COPD care. So welcome, we're really excited to hear from you. Thanks so much for being here. We're just, just pulling up slides. I wanna make sure our 10 minutes has not started yet for this, right? <laughs> the clock, I just wanna, we're okay still. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you all so much. My name is Ed Portillo. I'm a clinical pharmacist and a faculty member at our School of Pharmacy here at UW. Good morning, everyone. I'm Martha Maurer. I'm a scientist in the Sonreger Research Center, which is part of the School of Pharmacy. Uh, happy to be here. Awesome, yes. Clock starts. Okay, so thank you all. Really, honestly, we're, we're so honored to, to be here today and to be asked to share our, our research work uh, with, with you all, and we appreciate your insights. Uh, Martha and I today represent an amazing team, so we want to start there. So we have a great group uh, focused on our, our research work, focused on COPD care. Um, goals today in our 10 minutes, uh, first we just want to describe our program briefly, uh, relate implementation, the implementation outcomes framework that was described so well, my goodness, in our first session um, to scaling our program. And then in the true spirit of DNI, travel back in time and fix all the mistakes we made, right? So, so I should state that better. We're going to um, explore lessons learned and apply knowledge gained for the future. I'm sorry, how did that get in there, right? So, so, so first, what is COPD care? Um, so COPD care is a program that's within the VA. VA is the largest integrated medical uh, system in the United States, 171 medical centers, a huge, huge health system. COPD care integrates the interprofessional team to deliver effective COPD care transitions. How the program runs is when a veteran is discharged from the hospital or emergency department after a COPD flare, um, there's education provided in the hospital. And then what we do is our nurses contact the veteran within 48 hours of patient discharge and offer a wellness visit. This wellness visit occurs with a pharmacist and a nurse and the veteran. So it's an integrated visit where what we're really doing is taking, taking proven evidence-based practices and bundling them into this 45 to 60 minute clinic visit. So these are evidence-based practices that we know work, right? But we're putting them into this clinic visit for our veterans. Um, part of this visit involves an action plan. So we're providing our veterans with great information on what to do when a flare occurs and how to mitigate their COPD flare. After this wellness visit, we have a follow-up visit. This is a brief 15-minute phone call where we want to make sure all these interventions we made a month or so later are being carried out, right? Uh, so it's a fidelity check in itself. And then an annual visit with our primary care providers. So did all this work lead to a change, right? And our primary care providers can then review the information that we collected and the interventions that we made and help to develop a plan moving forward. So we uh, piloted COPD care in 2016 at one clinic with 16 patients, very small, and we had great outcomes, 0% readmission rate for 16 people, right? So very small, very small scale. But we realized early on that like what we were doing was changing how care was delivered. We were really strengthening connections across the VA centered around COPD management um, and really integrating services in a way that, what, that just didn't exist before. And that was exciting to us. So we felt like there was a real potential here 
for further clinician empowerment and scale up. And that's what leads to our journey scaling the program. And what I have here is our little logo. We, we are so proud of our logo, right? And um, applying our service to the implementation outcomes framework. So I'll describe our Calm expansion, where I feel like we really methodically <laughs> tried to do this well and, and, and use our implementation outcomes framework, and then we'll go into the chaos that ensued after that. So thank you, Martha, for talking about the chaos. So the calm, let's talk about the calm. So um, in 2018, um, COPD care was named one of 11 promising practices across the VA, which is really exciting. So we were paired with one VA in Fayetteville, Arkansas, to scale this program to over a one-year period. Um, so our scale up was Fayetteville, Arkansas, as well as a few clinics in Madison. Uh, in 2018, I, I heard we're all beginners. I was a pre-pre-beginner for DNI in 2018. Yes, so I attended my first short course. But one of the lessons I learned at that short course was an intervention will not be effective if it's not implemented well, right? And I kind of learned at that time this like, chicken and egg idea, and I realized, oh my gosh, like. What if this service fails, right? Like, what if the outcomes are not what I hope? Is that because the service itself doesn't work, or is this because the implementation was poorly done? You know, so it's like chicken egg, right? Well, it's, I guess the service is the chicken. I don't know. But anyways, you get the idea. So, so we did this intervention with two aims. We wanted to explore clinician perceptions of this implementation package for COPD care and evaluate the training impact on best practices in the field. What we did is over one year, we had some introductory meetings with our colleagues in Fayetteville. They are amazing people. It was great to work with them. We implemented this web-based training over four months. It was all remote, all virtual. And you can see a, a visual of that training. Uh, we conducted the training over four phases. Uh, nurses, pharmacists completed this training. And we had these phone calls in between each phase just to check in and answer, ask some questions about how things were going. At the end of this, we also had a no, we also built a note template. Okay. At the end of this, we had an on-site visit. Great picture of us from our team, right, in Fayetteville. Did some quick simulations, and, and they went live. So that was the one-year methods for this. Looking at our, our, our like application of the implementation outcomes framework, we had a questionnaire that we developed, and we issued it at the beginning of our, of our web-based training, at the end of our simulations, and then a year later because we really wanted to know, is this being sustained? Um, you can see here, the questionnaire was actually probably too long, who are we kidding? But we, we covered a lot of aspects of the implementation outcomes framework, acceptability, appropriateness, feasibility, sustainability. And when you look at our penetration, you know, we actually had a lot of patients, you know, 73 patients, or excuse me, 73 uh, clinicians that we trained across these different VAs. So it's pretty good penetration for our first real scale up for this. Um, and here's our outcomes. You can see our questionnaire focus areas, looking at penetration. And you can see here, um, let me see if I can get them out. There we go. Here's the initial um, you know, confidence, for example. Here's after the training and a year later. So the trend you're seeing is that you know, we have significant improvements from before and after training and one year later. You'll notice down here, this telehealth scale did like nothing. And that's good because we didn't do anything with telehealth. So this was just for discriminant validity, um, just to see like, <laughs> is this truly making a difference or are you just saying yes to things, right? So we, discriminant validity showed we were making a difference. We also then looked at the outcomes of the program. So are we actually leading to a change in practice? And you can see, you know, here in, in red, yeah, like practice changed from before versus after. Patients received different interventions and that led to improvements in readmissions, which was great. So we were very fortunate that the implementation did lead to good outcomes and we could track the whole process. So chaos now, here we go. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. So to continue the story, in 2019, the COPD care team reflected on what they had learned from the, the clinician training pilot that Ed just described. And despite all of the positive outcomes, they recognized that the pilot expansion took a lot of time. It took eight, over eight months, I think, yeah. and over 50 meetings. And they wanted to find a way to uh, speed up that process and enhance the, the rate at which the service could be scaled up. Um, they also heard some feedback through focus groups that the clinicians who were involved in the pilot, they encountered some challenges related to logistical 
um, aspects of setting up the COPD care service. So they were looking for some additional support in addition to that clinician-focused training um, as they were you know, implementing this at each of their local sites. So in response to this feedback and also in an effort to really optimize the efficiency of the program scale up, the COPD care team developed this new comprehensive implementation package, the COPD care academy. So you can see here that the academy not only involves that clinician training that they previously developed, but they added team-based collaborative learning. They added informatics support. They added guided implementation support, um, all to enhance the program. Also want to note that um, COPD Care Academy is delivered by a national team led, led by Ed and his colleagues, sort of acting as an external facilitator. And then um, each site also designates uh, sort of an internal facilitator and implementation lead to guide efforts within the site. Uh, something that's notable about the Academy is that it is um, completely virtual. So it is a one hour per week virtual synchronous, essentially a webinar or conference call over a five week period where the national facilitation team leads the call with all the implementation leads. So the academy is attended by about five to six VA medical centers at once. So again, enhancing that scale up by being able to incorporate um, more sites at once. So a little bit more about the academy. Again, the heart of the academy is the five week virtual program, ultimately leading to the completion of the clinician training um, and of course, launching the COPD care service. So these are the four COPD care academy workbooks that lay out step-by-step -step guidance for each implementation task. Um, teams are asked to review the pre-implementation workbook prior to the first academy session, and then they go through the bronze, silver, and gold workbooks throughout the five weekly sessions. And these are the topics covered during the virtual live discussions for each of the academy weeks. You can see how the workbooks are integrated in, in the material that's presented each week. Um, and guest speakers, some of whom had previously implemented COPD care attend some of the sessions to share their experiences. So here's where the chaos comes in. So beginning in 2020, the COPD Care Academy began this rapid expansion of the program um, across multiple field med medical centers to really try to scale up rapidly the program. This map shows uh, the sites that Ed mentioned, and then you can see in 2020, indicated by the Brown Stars, five VAs completed the COPD Care Academy, uh, Tomo, Wisconsin, and Kansas. And then in spring 2021, seven additional VA medical centers spanning the East and West Coast completed the, the Academy. And again, in summer of 2021, an additional five. So adding more and more sites. Early 22, five VA medical centers, the Gulf Coast area completed. And then finally, most recently, just a few months ago, um, five VA medical centers completed the academy. So this gives us in the span of two years, or maybe even a little less than two years, the COPD care service was scaled up to over 30 VA medical centers and clinics. Um, and again, we all know this was during um, the time of COVID, which added to the chaos. Um, so now we've had a chance to um, take a moment and reflect back on what we learned in that implementation. Um, the first two cohorts that went through the academy, cohorts three and four, they participated in a structured interview about six months after they completed the academy. So again, this was an opportunity for us to learn about their implementation experiences at that stage um, related to participation in the academy. So these were some of the implementation outcomes we learned about from analyzing those transcripts of the interviews. Uh, looking at acceptability or satisfaction with elements of the COPD Care Academy were rated very highly. Um, and you can see that clinicians at over 80% of the sites were in agreement that the Academy content was delivered in an effective way. Um, and here's a quote from a clinician uh, speaking to the relative advantage of the Academy resources and supporting uh, clinician training, which um, they hadn't had that support before. In terms of adoption, uh, these data reflect high utilization of the Academy resources, suggesting that it was being adopted 
by the clinicians. In terms of appropriateness, clinicians at three quarters of sites referenced the usefulness or the relevance of the academy um, in that it helped them prepare staff to deliver COPD care. This quote from a clinician highlights, um, again, the usefulness of those workbooks I mentioned in providing that step-by-step -step guidance for implementing COPD care. And then finally, sustainability of COPD care was represented by um, over three quarters of uh, clinicians reporting the continued participation in post-academy working group. Um, I think after the academy ended, I think on a monthly basis, clinicians had the opportunity to meet virtually and continue discussing clinical issues around COPD. And so there was this continued level of participation in that working group. Uh, and additionally, there's a, there's a quote here that mentions, um, again, the, this was you know, an interview six months after academy participation and the clinicians referenced that they were still accessing the COPD care resources and using them. So now we've had opportunity to reflect and now we're looking forward to the next project phase, which involves the scale up of COPD care to 17 uh, VA medical centers. And our evaluation is evolving such that we've worked with colleagues in the VA to develop this tool uh, called the Power BI, which is a COPD care data dashboard. Um, it provides real time data on sites performance and certain COPD care service elements. So quick example, uh, the percent of eligible patients that are referred to that initial wellness visit. So clinicians uh, on site can see their progress on a daily basis uh, and monitor it. These data, however, will also take us to the next level with our evaluation and give us an opportunity to look at fidelity outcomes um, in sort of more of a, um, maybe more of a rigorous way than we've been able to in the past. So we're very excited about taking our evaluation to the next level. And with that, Ed and I, again, would like to thank you for the opportunity to share this work, and we look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're excited to hear from our next um, guest team, um, which is uh, Edmund Ramley and Susan Nordam Oliveira, talking about implementing large scale data driven quality improvement in assisted living. And um, after their presentation, um, we will have uh, Dr. Proctor and Dr. Lyon as panelists to kind of reflect, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience as well. So we are in, we're looking forward to some lively discussions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ramley. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. So Susan was not able to join us today. She had to take care of a family issue, but uh, we improvised and thank you for my colleagues for uh, uh, setting, setting the stage and, and warming up the room and also setting uh, the expectation that this is all the work of chaos. Uh, it's all about building the plane while we fly and, and we didn't have a period of calm. It was all participatory design and implementation for 12 years and I'm gonna walk you through that journey. Uh, so, uh, in assisted living, we've got people who are living with uh, needs for uh, help with their activities of daily living. They're real people. They have uh, hobbies, they have needs, they have expectations, they have desires. They also need some help. Uh, and there are a wide diversity of these kinds of uh, patients and residents, we call them in the field of long-term care, who are living in these kinds of settings. And uh, 40 years ago, someone like that would have been living in a nursing home. And there's been changes and trends where over the years in Wisconsin and uh, uh, around the country, someone who might have been living in a nursing home is now living in assisted living. Unfortunately, uh, there are some concerns uh, of quality. Uh, and uh, um, this is really problematic and it requires the, a, a deliberate approach to continuous quality improvement. Uh, and, and it's looking like we, we don't have the right uh, set of slides, but that's okay, we'll improvise. Um, so, so, so the care of, of these residents is complex and uh, they, they, they require a deliberate approach to quality improvement. Uh, 
assisted living, unfortunately, unlike nursing homes that did not benefit from federal oversight and uh, uh, quality improvement support, uh, which calls the need for a, a hybrid approach that brings together internal quality improvement to complement external quality assurance. And so 12 years ago, a, a group of uh, public-private stakeholders in Wisconsin came together and formed the Wisconsin Coalition for Collaborative Excellence in Assisted Living. And this is an advisory group that has been meeting monthly since then. Uh, so hundreds of meetings, uh, doing the real hard work of building the plane as we're flying, participatory design and implementation of an approach to ensuring, ensuring continuous quality, bringing perspectives from uh, state regulatory and payment agencies, the state provider associations that represent and provide technical assistance and support to assisted living community organizations, uh, resident advocate uh, agencies, as well as uh, academic partners from the university. And we have uh, recently published uh, the implementation story of, of this large scale initiative uh, in, in JAMDA, and uh, this is what I'm going to talk to you about. So essentially what we did is we came together and identified what were the needs of these different stakeholder groups and what, their, what were their, uh, uh, the, the problems and opportunities in this industry and how we needed a different approach from what had been done in nursing homes to ensuring quality. And uh, they identified, uh, again, through participatory co-design, a set of uh, measures, uh, self-reported at the organization level, as well as uh, resident measures of satisfaction and quality of life, uh, where we get the quality improvement structure process and outcome measures on a quarterly basis, and the resident satisfaction survey on an annual basis. And these uh, organizations get interactive feedback reports uh, and, and the associations that sponsor them into this program uh, get those reports in aggregate form as well to inform supporting their quality improvement. So we have more than 400 assisted living communities that are members of this coalition and on a quarterly basis submit the, the, this, this data. We have a pretty high response rate even in the initial 20 quarters, and we've, we've uh, stayed uh, pretty high. There's been a little bit of a drop. And uh, for uh, resident level response rate, this is a pretty high uh, response rate of a voluntary survey among uh, residents uh, living in assisted living communities. So early adoption and reach, we had a, a, an increase over time in the number of organizations that joined uh, the, uh, the coalition. Uh, and you can see that some of that varies from one association to another. So we have four provider associations that are bringing in their members into uh, WIC seal and uh, uh, over time, some increased more than others. Uh, similarly, with the number of residents that were reached uh, by uh, uh, being part in, uh, of, of uh, communities that are part of Wixio. In terms of acceptability and appropriateness, there's lots of ways that we assess that in collaboration with our advisory group. Uh, and I want to uh, give you this quote from one of the assisted living communities that's sort of representative of some of the ideas behind this is an approach that is acceptable and appropriate for this, uh, for, for, for this setting. So uh, I'll, I'll read the part in, in bold. By being able to search, compare, and evaluate data, we can better focus our efforts and resources, which allow us in turn to improve the quality of care of our residents. More broadly, just the fact that we were able to have a coalition collaboratively established and uh, building something together among stakeholders from uh, government and industry and resident advocates is really unprecedented in the country and, and unique. So even that, the, the fact that the coalition was acceptable uh, and also the fact that it was acceptable to have a set of common measures 
that all of these uh, stakeholders agreed to, to, to build on for a large number of quarters and years uh, is, is also evidence of acceptability. In terms of appropriateness, uh, we started out hearing from stakeholders and from communities that uh, the focus of the questions were prime, was, was, was mainly aimed more compatible towards communities that serve uh, residents with advanced age more so than communities that serve residents with developmental disabilities. So in 2015, we brought together some working groups and developed additional questions to address uh, uh, th these, making sure that this is appropriate for a variety of uh, types of communities. So the thing, speaking uh, of, of the thing from, from Jeffrey Kern's uh, sort of uh, paper, the thing that we're implementing is the systems intervention that is a continuous quality improvement intervention at the system level across multiple organizations that has a component of shared assessment of structure, uh, process, and outcomes uh, of quality improvement. So that includes things like uh, to what extent is there uh, nursing access, uh, as part of the structure of the community, to what extent do they have in place uh, programs for false prevention, infection control in terms of the process, and what kind of outcomes do they have on uh, falls and infections and other things like that, as well as resident self-reported resident quality of life outcomes. And then the feedback uh, reports that they get uh, in real time through the information system that is secure and password protected allow them to look over time at uh, uh, their, their own data and compare it to whatever peer group of organizations they think is relevant to them. So we have filters for uh, size and primary population and so on. And then they get targeted support from their associations. So this is like the quality improvement cycle that you may be familiar with. So, Appropriateness and access acceptability, I talked about, we got that primarily through the advisory board, getting that information for us from their members. And then in terms of feasibility, and we have more details in, in the paper uh, about that, and I had more details about that in, in my other set of slides, but uh, essentially we had high feasibility uh, in terms of, of the 800 communities that ever joined this program, 82% of them were able to do it. And then some of them disenrolled, which is a different issue. In terms of fidelity, uh, members that stayed in good standing, there were 88%. And then uh, members that stayed in good standing for at least two years, so eight quarters, 71%. So that's, that's, the, that's the good news. The bad news is that we still don't have as much adoption across all of the eligible assisted living communities in the state of Wisconsin and ultimately around the country. So right now this is just a Wisconsin-based uh, initiative. Uh, and similarly for penetration in terms of number of uh, uh, percentage of, of residents that, that are part of this. Uh, there are other uh, uh, good news in terms of penetration and sustainability that are not sort of numerical. So over the years, we have moved from this being dependent on research grants for its sustainment to, uh, in large part, this is now supported by the state annual budget, as well as some federal matching funds from CMS. So that's uh, penetration and sustainability, as well as there's been some programs that have been put in place at the state to provide incentives for uh, managed care organizations that fund uh, residents uh, on Medicaid uh, to, to give them monetary incentives if their residents are in uh, uh, an assisted living community that is part of Wisconsin, uh, of the, the Wisconsin Collaborative for uh, Coalition for Collaborative Excellence and Assisted Living, Wixia. And, uh, and so there's, there, there's a, a long way to go, but uh, essentially the, the, the good news is that uh, we, we have been able to, to ramp up from the beginning in 2013 to now having some stability, but the challenge is figuring out how to reach 
those organizations and residents that are still out of reach, uh, both in Wisconsin and, uh, and beyond. Uh, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Edmund, for that wonderful presentation. You did a great job, even though you were left alone to your own devices. Um, at this point, I would invite um, Aaron and Enola to reflect and sort of um, give any questions or comments on what we heard from our presenters. It's the upward, the upward motion. How about that? Um, these were great, two great presentations. Um, and I love the sort of beginning of the highlighting with chaos and whether it's sustained chaos or whether it's um, you know chaos just during certain phases. I think that that really resonates, certainly resonated with me. And I think every project I've ever done um, that has felt chaotic. Um, mostly for the entire duration of it. And then rolling with it, whether you're rolling with it in the context of the project or rolling with it because you happen to encounter an older slide deck than you anticipated. Um, all of that, good skills for implementation scientists. Um, I mean, and I think another sort of theme, of course, was the potential for large scale impact across these two different studies, um, which was also really impressive yeah um and that that's really the ultimate goal even if we're beginning with smaller stage um implementation projects i think we all have designs on getting toward you know larger and larger scale ultimately whether sooner or later um, i also saw across both of these presentations lots of different implementation outcomes measured um, in one form or another sometimes more qualitatively sometimes more quantitatively and i think that that's uh, fantastic and and important and I think as a field as we have sort of you know complex implementation strategies and multifaceted implementation strategies one of the things that we can begin to work um, more and more toward and they had relatively brief amounts of time so I don't know the extent to which that may have been true in either of these um, projects but to work toward some uh, specification of the relationships between strategies and strategy components and perhaps different implementation outcomes. Um, I think there's probably some strategies that are more likely to impact initial adoption, whereas there might be others that could um, influence things like appropriateness or some of those things that might be a little more perceptual in nature. And then, of course, still others that might uh, affect the extent to which something is delivered as intended, i.e. fidelity. Um, so those are a few initial thoughts from me. I can hand it over to another. Thanks, Aaron, and thank you both for um, such interesting presentations. Um, you know, I used to advise people to um, not stretch their ambition so that they measured all the implementation outcomes, um, including scale up, which is an important um, addition to our thinking about implementation outcomes. But kudos, you did it. Um, I'm going to have to <clears throat> change my perspective about that. It is possible, um, and it, it, you did it very, very well with, as Aaron said, a lot of uh, variety in your measurement approaches. Um, I, too, really appreciated um, the chaos. You know, when I uh, used to teach research design, I would um, emphasize that it's all about variance. You know, there's variance everywhere, and what we're trying to do is improve our clarity about the variance, um, control some variance, minimize some, maximize others. So get a handle on variance. And I think that applies to the concept of chaos. Um, I perceived some in both of your um, presentations that your projects 
as you monitored results as you were moving forward, um, your projects had the potential to highlight decreased chaos that you learned a lot. Um, and one of the things I was wondering as you, um, as you progressed through your talks that I'd like to hear your thoughts about is um, how did what you learned about outcomes help you uh, refine, tailor, adapt uh, your implementation strategies um, and um, you know, highlight areas where work remains. Do you care to comment about that? Sure. That's a great question. Is it on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The phenomenon of mice. Yes. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a great question, and, and it dovetails to what we were talking about earlier about the dynamicity, right, and, and context dependence. So uh, uh, yes, the answer is yes. And, and, and I'll give one example. So one of the things that we learned One of the things that we learned. Better? No. Okay, I'll just project. <clears throat> so, so, so one of the things that we learned, uh, even early on, uh, was that uh, there was only so much, so far, that we could get with uh, the centralized interactive assistance from a, a help desk to help with technical issues related to using the information system and, and uh, doing sort of the assess and feedback pieces of that assess feedback support and adapt loop. And we, we, we realized that the, the, the role of the associations as not only sponsors of these uh, uh, organizations into the program, uh, but also as sort of shepherds and making sure that not only were they doing quality improvement, but they were, they were also uh, being part of the program with fidelity was important. And so that led us to uh, formalizing some of the membership rules and formalizing some of the strategies and best practices that we were seeing some of the more successful associations using and uh, spreading them to the other associations and sort of saying, being part of this program means doing these things. Uh, and so that, that came directly out of us learning from the differential implementation outcomes that we were getting from uh, uh, organizations that were part of different associations and what was working and not, and sort of formalizing it at the central level uh, as, uh, as an implementation strategy, if that makes sense. I hope the details to that are in the paper that you referenced, which I confess I haven't uh, had time to read. Um, and if they're not, I hope you will really highlight that because it speaks to um, the earlier, Peg's earlier comment about um, uh, the fidelity and, you know, fidelity and adaptation in response to ongoing data receipt. Yeah. That's an important um, and healthy tension. Absolutely agree. So the paper right now is telling the summative story, mm -hmm. but going back uh, in time yes. and, and, and tell, tell, telling the story how it unfolded uh, very well could be another paper. Yeah. All right. Okay. Can you hear me at all? Yeah. Kind of? Okay. I'm, it's very I close to my mouth. mouth. That's good. Okay. <laughs> So I, I appreciate the question. Thank you. And it, it's a great opportunity to reflect, right? Just like Edmund did. So in that initial, I feel very fortunate that we were able to measure the aspects of the framework um, so, so well on that initial implementation, because that was really our only chance to do this with one VA. And, and it, they were such great partners. I mean, I reflect back on this. I'm like, wow, like they were willing to meet 50 times with us. Like, who does that, right? That was so nice. And like, they were so invested on making this program work, right? So the irony of this whole thing was, you know, while the program was designed that we were supposed to be the like 
external experts in this program. I think we learn more from them than, than they learn from us, you know, just truly. Um, a few examples, right? So it took, I, I very quickly like shared um, this like image of our note template on the screen, right? And like, it took them three months to build that note template at their VA, right? I mean, that's a lot of time. And I thought, oh my gosh, like if there was a way for us to make these note templates nationally available, that would cut off three months of implementation time, like right there, right? And it took us eight months to go through the VA process <laughs> to make them nationally available, but boy, did it pay off. I mean, because now VAs can just literally download these things and like within an hour, they're available, right? And like another example of something we learned, the clinical training. And I share with you like, oh, we had four phases of training and everyone did the training. Then we had phone calls and like that took three or four months and we realized afterwards, like, wow, if we could just like really relay to sites the importance of just for three hours, closing the grids and doing a seminar series for their training, we could take four months of time and turn it into three hours of time and it's done, right? And, and we also realized like we were owning the training process externally. Like we were the ones doing these calls and we really, you know, that's really not as effective as um, like having a train the trainer model where the site owns the training and there's someone then that's really elevated to a lead role that keeps this going as clinical care changes. So those are two examples, like those two little, like little things cut like six months of time, you know, and what we would never knew going in. And it was thanks to the Fayetteville team for their willingness to go through all these hoops for us to realize it. Yeah, I mean, Martha, I know you, Martha looked at so many transcripts up for this. Oh my gosh, so maybe you have things to add as well. Yeah. Sure, so um, I think the one thing that I would add is regarding the, the note templates. So in addition to analyzing the, the transcripts, we had an opportunity more recently to do a participatory design um, evaluation where we actually met with some of the sites that had been interviewed and we were able to, to dig much deeper into some of their challenges and barriers. And regarding the note templates as an example, we learned that um, you know, there were challenges with integrating the note templates into the workflow of the appointment. And so subsequently, we didn't have time to present all this, but we've been developing additional strategies to help improve how to integrate those templates. So I think as we, um, as the, yeah, we'll keep moving forward, it's, it's um, there are more opportunities to integrate new strategies. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question, yeah. Yeah, I think that's so great um, because, um, you know, if we knew how to implement well at the outset, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be in business. Um, we wouldn't have quality gaps. Um, we wouldn't um, be stuck with, I'm not sure it's 17 years. There's a recent paper that I'll reference tomorrow that shows that in cancer, it's now 16 years. <laughs> Progress. Um, yeah, we took off one year and so many years of doing this. Um, but, um, it, it's really important to capture the process as we go, to learn, and then to, you know, I mean, the, the future of this work really depends on all of your contributions because you're, you're learning valuable lessons um, and minimizing the chaos that other people facing similar implementation challenges um, will face. So we narrowing the, the chaos. Learning, for example, you know, why are what's different about the sites that um, where penetration is still a challenge? What's different? Uh, how can we compare um, the sites that it went well with and those that are lagging behind the others? Another thing that this conversation just up here has made me think about is that chaos is expensive. And I wonder um, if sort of in this formative stage and sort of learning and reducing chaos, if you've had any opportunities to sort of think about the costs of different um, pieces of your implementation strategies. I think, Ed, you were already referencing some of that um, when you were talking about sort of shifting to maybe to a train-the-trainer model or something else that presumably um, could 
reduce costs, at least if done certain ways. Um, and I just sort of wonder if that's something that you've um, reflected on that either sort of team has, has reflected on. I know we're here to talk about implementation outcomes, but you can't talk about implementation outcomes without talking about implementation strategies, some of which are, are more expensive than others. Yeah, so uh, when I was a pre-beginner in dissemination science, I used to say, oh, there's no cost because um, all the resources are already in existence at VAs. And I realized early on, like, that was totally not true, right? Like, there's a cost for everything. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Is that what they say? I don't even know. Except for today. We do get a free lunch today. But, um, <laughs> but um, you know, there's like, 50, I mean, 50 meetings. That was a lot of meetings. And those clinicians were getting paid for those meetings. So there was definitely a cost, right? And um, some of the things that we did, I think, to make this doable was actually, yeah, saying you don't need to hire new FTE for this service was good because that's a huge barrier. If we tell VAs, like, you have to hire a pharmacist to do this program, they're going to be like, well, where am I going to get money to hire a pharmacist? Like, that, that does help. But you know, one of the things that we did is we made the, the whole implementation process virtual. And we did that just by darn luck because we had no idea COVID-19 was coming, right? But, but we knew that the expense of travel would hinder our implementation. I mean, even scaling this to Rockford, Illinois and Baraboo clinics locally in our region would have been hard without virtual training because you have to travel there. It takes time and money and so um, the virtual training and the virtual facilitation that we did as external facilitators, I think was very helpful. And what we learned from our first expansion was the idea of like team-based problem solving virtually, that was a really powerful tool. And so what we did when Martha was describing, you know, our scale up is we intentionally made this a cohort experience. So we had five VAs all doing this together and all doing, discussing at least the same tasks. They were all different places, but discussing the same tasks so that they could problem solve together. Like, oh, like we had this issue. And then a VA in DC might say, oh, you know, we did this to, to help with that. So that team-based peer-to-peer -peer facilitation, I think was really helpful. I don't know, Martha, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah. No, I don't think so. I think that- Okay, it. okay, great. Great, and if I can just yeah. pause for a second and highlight something that your last comment beautifully illustrated. Now, one of the things we called for in the 2011 paper was looking at the interrelationships among implementation outcomes. And I heard in your recent comments that you know if you could show ways to minimize the cost, that probably had an effect on acceptability. Yeah. It probably had a huge effect on feasibility it probably had a huge effect on sustainability um, and probably ultimately um, um, scale up. Um, so we, we lack data to show those precise um, empiric, the, the empirical basis for those relationships. But that is a really concrete example of a point that I made that might have seemed obtuse. And I just wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to use your statement to help clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. So I think the question about costs is very important and is ingrained in our training as engineers. So Andrew Kwambeck and, and myself are trained as engineers. And we are trained to think about what kind of outputs can you get for what kind of inputs. And cost is one of the, the inputs, monetary costs. There are other costs as well. And this conversation, uh, makes me think of three important dimensions of cost when we, when we think about it in relation to implementation outcomes and strategies. One, cost of what, cost for whom, and what kind of cost. So when I think about the cost of Wix seal, if you ask me how much does Wix seal cost, I can, t I can give you the, uh, the amount of money that the state budget is putting towards the operation and maintenance of Wixio. That's $400,000 a year. It, it grew from earlier to 200,000. There is, the, the, I can give you the amount of money that has gone in terms of research grants that has supported the formative design work, and then later on the 
the implementation work, so that's 200,000 plus 1 million over two years and then five years. So we're already talking huge costs, but we're also talking spread across a large number of organizations that are benefiting from this. And a lot of these formative costs are, are, are now done, right? So once you uh, go through the chaos of design, uh, you're not going to go through it again to the same magnitude. Uh, then then you, you, you have maintenance costs and operation costs, but you've already uh, spent the costs and are starting to reap the benefits of, of the design. And, 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 and there's all kinds of non-explicit um, costs, people's time, right? to be part of these advisory group meetings every month for uh, 12 years, that is in-kind costs, right? Now, it's aligned with the, their organization's missions, which is great. So if you can find ways to, to uh, leverage existing resources in ways that are aligned with what you're building, that's fantastic. There's also, uh, uh, from the perspective of, so asking for whom, when you scale back from looking at the whole system, how much does it cost? From the perspective of a single assisted living community, they often raise as a, a perceived barrier to acceptability and adoption, the question of how much does it cost me to join? And they have the perception that it costs a lot. But then when you talk about it, well, you don't have to pay anything to use the system because the state is paying for that. And you can choose whichever of these four associations to become a member of. They have different cost structures. Some might better fit your budget. Uh, but then they say, okay, well, how much of my staff's time goes into being part of this? So there are uh, non-monetary costs directly that could be translated into monetary costs because you're saying, you know, this much of my staff's time every quarter is going to be spent on this. So it's... a, a I think when we talk about implementation costs, it's helpful to think about the levels uh, and to think about for whom uh, uh, and uh, 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 what kinds of costs are we talking about. And cost of what? Cost of design, cost of implementation, cost of operation and maintenance. Yeah, I love that observation and it um, aligns with something that muddling over for um, two or three years, and it's reflected some in a paper that I'm going to reference tomorrow, our uh, recently published FAST paper. You know, I'm, uh, and I think you, you both are beautifully uh, positioned to help shed light on this, but I'm wondering if we can make implementation more efficient, take less time, um, as uh, adopters and implementers, be that organizations, systems, or individuals, accrue more implementation experience, expertise, capacity, facility. You know, are there, um, first of all, is, um, can people bank on what they've learned, what they've developed in terms of infrastructure um, to help facilitate implementation? Is there, um, less intimidation um, to adopting something new if, you know, I often start with organizations saying, tell me about something. Everybody's implementing. They may be implementing substandard care. They may be implementing great care. But tell me your story of when you started with that. What made it go well? What were the challenges to help people perceive that, you know, they've done this before and they have some lessons um, to draw on, but uh, we rarely make that um, that reflecting on implementation experience. You know, I, I looked, did a literature search once, to little avail, I found an article that was using the term differently, but is there implementation capacity that we need to build in organizations? And Aaron, you would probably be well positioned to tell us stories of school districts that have adopted multiple new practices, et cetera. I think we're getting near out of time. Does, uh, okay, sorry. Can I just squeeze in one comment? Yeah. 
So I, I think implementation capacity is part of it. I think it's implementation capital. That, uh, yes. that, that, yes. that we're building, and we definitely have seen evidence of that here, both at the system level and at the level of individual organizations. We've also seen that when we've worked in primary care clinics and implemented one intervention and then came back and implemented another intervention, uh -huh. they have more readiness for that one because they did the previous. Oh, please write a paper. Back. <laughs> <laughs> um, this it concludes this panel session, which has been really wonderful. Um, I was hoping to invite the audience to ask questions. I was actually supposed to get to ask a question too, but these people were just having such an engaging conversation that I couldn't interrupt. Um, so we're, you know, I think we're we're all learning together, um, and so I hope those of you who are new to implementation science are realizing that even the experts in the field are constantly um, uncovering things that we don't know. So this is a, you know, really we encourage you, we welcome you to join this, to join us in answering all these really interesting questions. And as a nod to that, we're now going to do an interactive activity. Um, so we're all going to get our hands wet. We're going to um, divide into groups and do an applied activity to really learn how to apply implementation outcomes to the work we're doing. Thank you.